Hello and welcome to today's briefing on U.S. infrastructure and hunger, lessons from the COVID-19 crisis and guidance for the future. My name is Eric Mitchell and I am the Executive Director of the Alliance to End Hunger, a coalition of organizations from diverse sectors committed to building the public and political will to end hunger in the United States and around the world. At the Alliance, we have seen the, the extreme pressures that the current crisis has put on food systems, both in the US and abroad. And I look forward to our discussion today. I would, I would like to thank our friends at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations for their partnership in pulling together this event today. I also want to thank Senator Sherrod Brown, who we will be hearing from in a few moments, and all of our speakers today. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. Today's event is being recorded and live streamed on Twitter on the FAO North America page. A recording will be shared with participants in the next few days. You can also add to the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Build Back Better and Food Systems. Due to time constraints, we will provide short introductions of our speakers. A link to all of the speakers' bios will be shared in the chat box. We invite you to share your comments and relevant links to in publications in the chat at the bottom of your page. Please use the Q&A box for questions that you have, stating your name and affiliation. Panelists are welcome to respond to questions in the Q&A box or offer their comments in the chat box while they are not actively speaking. I would now like to turn things over to my friend and colleague, Vimlindra Sharan, Director of the FAO Liaison Office in North America. Vimlindra, thank you again for your partnership and your leadership. Thank you, Eric, and warm greetings uh, from DC to all our participants joining in from uh, various parts of the world, and especially to over 40 uh, staffers joining in from the Hill. Uh, this congressional briefing actually was designed pre-COVID to, it was designed to actually bring information to the staffers and help them understand what FAO, what Alliance, what other uh, players in this field are doing in the, field, in, in the sector of food security and nutrition. Uh, it's just that COVID gave us an opportunity to really open it up worldwide and we now have people uh, joining in from all corners of the world. So thank you all very much. Uh, as Eric mentioned, a special word of thanks to Senator Bra, who joins us today to share with us his vision and his ideas. For those of you who do not know, uh, Senator Bra co-sponsored the Food Supply Protection Act introduced last year and is a strong voice uh, behind the cause of uh, uh, ensuring that food reaches those in need and supply issues, supply chain breakages do not come in the way. We uh, also would like to uh, warmly welcome our other speakers, uh, DDG Beth Bechdahl uh, from FAO. We have Kelly Adesina from uh, Bear. We have Aaron Sher from National Farmers Union and Carrie Calvert from the uh, Feeding America. So a very, very warm welcome to all of you. As everyone is aware, uh, oh, we are nearly a year down uh, uh, since the pandemic started, a couple of months more than a year down. And I think this is, uh, we thought this would be a right time to take pause and, and really reflect upon the impact which the pandemic has had on the food supply system and where, uh, where did we go wrong or where do you think the cracks uh, really appeared which need to be mended and mended fast because this is uh, rest assured, not the last pandemic that the world is seeing. So these, these things will keep coming. We have to gear ourselves to ensure that when such pandemics and other calamities do strike, the food systems do not suffer. Uh, it, is, it is really ironical that uh, the, in this beginning of this pandemic, we saw food going waste while people going hungry. And this has happened right here in America. It's not a story that we bring from the least developed countries of the developing world. This has happened in developed uh, parts of the world. And a speaker from Feeding America uh, will note and you will hear how food banks and other human service organizations uh, experienced exceptionally high uh, demand during the pandemic. 
and these pictures of miles and miles of cars lined up to take food of people who had never ever visited food bank before. They are, they are actual pictures, they, are, they were reality. And how still the food bank struggled while on the other end meat plants closed down, while on the other end food was thrown, milk was, uh, uh, it was, uh, milk was uh, spoiled and thrown, but not, could not reach those in need. We have had the problem even pre-COVID of, of uh, disrupted supply chains and chronic and acute hungers is that the pandemic really made the situation acute and has brought back into focus the need to really mend, uh, mend, the, mend the processes and the whole supply chain. Uh, what are the possible actions and government working both domestic and international partners? We have a responsibility to facilitate the movement of workers and of uh, agri-food products. It's imperative that uh, countries keep the food supply chain on both domestic and internationally. It's imperative that rest trade restrictions do not come into play uh, where unnecessary because it hurts both the producers and the consumers and in the long run, the whole global uh, food supply chain. So these are, these are important issues. I can go on and on on, on uh, uh, what needs to be done, what happened, but I'm sure that would be taking away from the thunder of all our speakers who have all uh, some very valuable insights and points to share with all of you. So I will stop here and uh, I will uh, welcome all of you again and request all of you to be really participative because there is no one solution. Our speakers will share their ideas. They, they are extremely knowledgeable. They have seen what has happened around the world. They have seen what has happened in US. They have worked in the area. They will give solutions. But despite that, let me tell you, those are not the final solutions and those are not the only solutions. Much of what comes will come from where, what you share with us, your ideas, what you think could be possible solutions uh, going forward. So please use the chat box. Please be interactive. Please put your questions. Please put your ideas there so that uh, we can take this conversation forward and we do not really stop right here with the webinar as if everything is done and dusted. But we need to really keep talking about these issues and working on them and finding solutions in con contexts which vary from country to country. So with those words, uh, let me hand over the uh, proverbial virtual mic back to Eric uh, to take the conversation forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ben Linger, for giving such a great uh, summary of our conversation today. Um, before we, before uh, Senator Brown arrives, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ms. Beth Bechtel. Beth Bechtel is the Deputy Director General of FAO. Ms. Bechtel is responsible for FAO's partnership and outreach work, including partnerships with UN, collaboration, rescue mobilization, and private sector partnerships. Uh, her full bio is in the chat. Uh, Deputy Director General Bechtel, thank you for joining us today. Thanks very much, Eric, and thanks to my colleagues in our DC office, Ben Lindra and others for the invitation to be with you uh, here virtually from Rome, uh, the FAO headquarters. And uh, I would just say to start, it's, it's a really, I think, timely conversation and one that I really appreciate the organizers' attention to putting this group of us together. Because even for me personally, I grew up on a family farm that still operates today in Indiana, just right next door to Senator Brown's home state as well. Um, so from the very productive, uh, fertile landscape of the Midwest, um, I've been here in Rome now with FAO working on these global issues for a year. I arrived in Rome four days before the country of Italy went into its own national lockdown, all tied to COVID. So this all comes very much full circle for me. Um, being familiar with the US agricultural supply chain, um, I've, I've spent time on the Hill, I've spent time in industry, come again from a family farm, watching from Italy 
all of the things that were happening in US agriculture and in US food and agricultural systems was quite striking. Um, and in contrast to the things that we were seeing and observing here uh, at FAO around the world. So again, thank you for the invitation for putting this very important discussion together. And it's my pleasure to try to offer perhaps a few comments um, about the global perspective on some of what has come as a result of, of COVID and the ways that we think about food value chains and now food systems. I will have to admit this, this first slide is the depressing slide. Um, this is the one that actually paints a pretty bleak picture uh, for the state of hunger, the state of health, the state of poverty, the state of income inequality. And as Vimlendra, I think, referenced, uh, COVID-19 came at a time when we were already beginning to move off track uh, of so many important development goals that the world collectively has been trying to achieve. Um, since 2014, the decades-long decline that we had been seeing in hunger around the world had ended. And now today we have more than 690 million people in the world, almost 9% of the world's population who are hungry. We have 650 million people considered obese, while 10% of the world's population are living in extreme hunger. We have 3 billion people on this planet who cannot afford a healthy diet, a healthy and nutritious diet, not just safe and affordable, but healthy and nutritious. And at the same time, income inequality and gaps in our economic and fiscal resources continue to widen. Then when it relates to food and agriculture as a source of livelihood for so many around the world, this is all compounded by other very critical existing threats, whether that be conflict, natural disasters, climate change, pests and plagues, all of these are str stressing, excuse me, our food systems and triggering food insecurity all around the world. I think also before talking about food systems or supply chain impacts directly, in an audience like this, it is also increasingly important for us to collectively acknowledge the impacts that COVID-19 is having on children our next generation around the world. It is really hard, I think, for all of us to appreciate the impacts that COVID is going to have over the coming years, whether that be on our next generation's educational achievement and attainment, on their mental well-being, but also very importantly, on their underlying health as supported physically by access to nutritious foods. We are already in just the year that has taken place as a result of COVID, seeing more childhood stunting, we are seeing wasting, and we are also seeing obesity numbers on the rise. And I just would continue to encourage all of us who work in food and agriculture to not lose sight of this focus that I think needs to come today more than ever on our young people, on children, and as I said, this next generation of, of contributors to society, next generation for food and agriculture. This is an incredibly important aspect, I think, of how we need to target not only our ideas and our solutions, but also to bring together a number of our efforts to ensure that we really do address these fundamental issues for them. COVID-19, when it came, uh, it was clear that the disruptions were immediate. Uh, this was not a, a challenge, a pandemic that really sort of uh, slowly found its way into our, our daily lives. It was so fast, so furious, and also I think has been an epidemic, a pandemic that we have realized has touched every life on this planet. Uh, there is no one that has been left unaffected by COVID-19 in some way. And for today's discussion, I think as Ben Linder pointed out in his opening, what it also has done is it has highlighted many of the fragilities of our contemporary food systems. The challenges that have emerged include access, not necessarily availability, but access to safe, nutritious food at affordable prices. It has exposed in many cases, the vulnerability of people, the vulnerability of employees, 
the vulnerability of a workforce all across the food system. And it has even demonstrated that in many cases, the survival, the very livelihood, the very effectiveness of firms and industries, farms, of businesses all across the food and agricultural value chain are at risk. Again, whether that be producers, manufacturers, traders, food processors, transporters, or retailers. In the US, the ripple effects of a seemingly well-balanced system were also evident. Distribution channels were upended, which meant that food access was problematic. And this creates food security risks, oftentimes for the most vulnerable of populations, whether that be those suffering from poverty, the elderly, young people, other disadvantaged groups. Companies that produce, process, and deliver food to consumers and businesses are today, we know more than ever, re-examining risks and uncertainties across all steps in the value chain, from farmers to end customers. And not surprisingly, all this creates uncertainty across the global value chain with distinct challenges for farmers, for producers, consumers, packaged good companies and retailers alike. Much depends very quickly on how we adapt to these new sensitivities and how we find a way together to return to pre-pandemic norms and standards. But disruptions to food systems also create opportunities to drive longer term transformation, including for organizational and social innovation, low and high tech innovation, automation, digitalization, and other technologies are increasingly being adopted that will better protect workers, consumers, and all of those engaged in the food and agricultural value chain. COVID-19 has indeed given us an opportunity to rethink solutions to labor shortages, to reevaluate value chains, and to consider new approaches to logistics and infrastructure. And if we are to maintain the aspirations of what is known as the Agenda 2030, building back better is the only option ahead of us. And therefore, some of the fundamental longer term challenges to the sustainability of food systems still need to be overcome and factored into response and recovery plans. In this context, I would argue that we should aim to catalyze today more than ever the transformation to food systems that are resilient to shocks and even climate change related events. We need to ensure individual health and well being. We need to promote inclusion and improve environmental and economic sustainability by increasing efficiency and reducing waste. In this sense, FAO has been working on its own COVID-19 response and recovery program, an initiative that was structured around several key objectives generated from country level national governments that are considered to be inspirational regarding what needs to be done in the coming years to create better food systems. Let me very quickly go through these few items and then we'll close and uh, allow for the other speakers uh, to come in to follow. First, I think this gives us an increasingly important opportunity to increase the adoption of technical and institutional innovations all along the supply chain, whether that's ensuring improved food and input logistics and distribution, our food procurement practices, the adoption of e-commerce and other types of important platforms, there is increasingly an opportunity for us to bring more innovation into these supply chains. We also can strengthen the capacity to enhance food safety and nutritional quality across food systems. Focusing on capacities that quickly facilitate a switch from emergency or crisis mode to maintain food safety, to really rethink and expand food safety infrastructure, regulations, and technologies. We can increase our capacity to reduce food loss and waste in a more inclusive and sustainable way through innovations, whether that be product reformulation, processing, packaging, and preservation of better quality, safe and nutritious food products, including those that would have a longer shelf life. 
We can enhance the capacity of agri-food enterprises and value chain stakeholders as being key drivers of food systems transformation. This includes interaction with the private sector, more public-private partnerships, and bringing more dialogue and engagement among key stakeholders. We can work to attract investment for the green recovery of food value chains to help address the short-term disruptions that are being caused by COVID-19 while laying the foundation for a more green and resilient post-crisis recovery, introducing, for example, sustainability conditions to financial stimulus packages or financial products, and by reducing these higher levels of environmental and sustainability risks. And finally, I think more than ever, there's the opportunity for more improved institutional and policy environment reform. This is at the global, the regional, the national, and even in the states, at the state and local levels. This needs to include an analysis of the trade-offs of certain policies, incorporate more dialogue among policymakers and key stakeholders, all to ensure that we bring, I think, a much more concerted effort to address these immediate impacts, but be able to also together support the transition to more sustainable food systems in the long term. In closing, let me just say that while many of these that I have touched on are considered global concepts focused on food systems transformation, I do think they are quite relevant to the discussions taking place in this very session and across the United States and other advanced food and agricultural economies about the need for more efficient, inclusive, and now more than ever resilient supply chains. I am convinced that ag tech and food tech advancements will drive this and that policy and social innovations and strategic partnerships and collaborations will also be required. Again, thank you to all of you for participating in today's conversation. Thanks again to my colleagues, Eric, to you for helping put today's dialogue together. And I so look forward to hearing the comments of Senator Brown and so many other important stakeholders as we advance this important conversation. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Beth, for such a great presentation. And I'm, I'm hoping that those slides can also be available uh, to, the, to the group later on. Uh, it is now my distinct pleasure to welcome Senator Sherrod Brown from Ohio. Senator Brown has represented the state of Ohio since 2007. He chairs the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. He also serves on the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, and is co-chair of the Senate Hunger Caucus. Um, again, a more complete bio is in the chat box. But Senator Brown, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Mitchell, and enjoy the comments of Ms. Bechtel. Thanks for your service uh, with, the, with the, the work you're doing. And I, um, I, I years ago, I um, many of you know that that George McGovern served as uh, as U.S. ambassador to the UN agencies for food and agriculture in Rome, and uh, I sit at Senator McGovern's desk in the Senate floor, and I spoke with him one time, maybe a decade ago, and you have probably heard this story because I wasn't the only one he told it to about his time in Rome. And he told me about an audience he had with um, Pope John the 23rd, neither George nor I was Catholic, but the story is still great. And he said to McGovern, when God asked you to feed the hungry, you can say you surely did. And that was uh, that to George McGovern was one of the most meaningful moments of his life. And all, all of you can say the same. So um, thank you. Probably won't have a Pope say that to you, but you can say it to each other and you can tell your children and your grandchildren of, of your service and how important that is. Um, the pandemic has been, as we know, the great revealer. It's laid bare the racial disparities, the income inequality in our society. It reminds us that hard work isn't paying off for all that many people in this country, whether it's a working mother in Tony Hall's Dayton who's had to rely on SNAP benefits for the first time to put food on the table, or the worker at the meatpacking plant in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, faced with the nearly impossible decision of choosing between a paycheck or protecting her family from the virus. And we know how many had to choose uh, her paycheck and how many came down with COVID uh, working at that plant. The pandemic also revealed 
just how fragile our food system is. We see all the pictures of farmers plowing under crops and dairies dumping milk because of the decline in demand. We have the most efficient food supply system in the world, but it's not nearly as resilient as so many told us it was. The just-in-time system is a marvel of logistics and modern farming, but it resulted in the destruction of tens of millions of pounds of food at the same time as unemployment was soaring. Businesses across the country were closing. Food banks were opening food distribution sites with cars waiting in line for miles. In Ohio, the, we relied on the National Guard to, to volunteer at food banks because most food banks at least in my state, I assume everywhere, most of the volunteers are older and were told probably not a good idea and many didn't decided not to volunteer as a result. The good news, we did step up to provide relief to millions of people last year in March and, 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 and then again in March, especially in March with the, with the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we increased and made it easier to access SNAP benefits. We helped farmers find new markets for crops. We provided universal free school meals to children. Uh, we need to seize the moment as we build on this pro on this progress. I leaving the Senate that uh, that was on March sixth. We had been in voting all night um, from for 12, 13 hours. The final vote was about noon, 12:30, something like that, on Saturday, March sixth. And like sending next to Senator Casey um, on the Senate floor is one of the world champions of children in our society, nationally and internationally. I would add, um, he. Uh, I, we were just talking as I was walking out and a reporter said, what'd you think? Tell me what you think. And I said, this is the best day of my career, of my professional life, because what we did in that bill from helping pensioners to uh, what we did with SNAP benefits, what we did with Medicaid, especially what we did um, to expand something I've been working on for eight years to expand the child tax credit. 92% of people in my state, 92% of Ohioans will benefit from that. It will reduce the poverty rate in half. So we seize the moment to build on that progress. We're not done. Too many people work full time, yet corporations don't pay them enough to put food on the table. Too many children go without during summer months and weekends and during vacations. Our food banks are stretched to the breaking point. And we need to improve our food system, make it more inclusive and resilient, as Ms. Bechtel said. We can ensure that men and women working in packing plants or on food production lines are treated with the dignity they deserve and are at a workplace that values their safety. Next week is um, a celebration of something probably most of you have never heard of. It's Workers Memorial Day. Uh, we every eight, Late April every year in this country, we celebrate those workers who were injured on the job or killed on the job. Uh, I've, got, I've been involved in this since some, some years ago. Um, I was at a Workers Memorial Day rally in Lorain, Ohio, and I was given this pen that you may or may not be able to see. It's a depiction of a canary in a birdcage. The mine workers took a canary down in the mines. There was no union strong enough to protect them and no government that cared enough to protect them in those days. Uh, and workers were on their own and they are still too often on their own. We know so many of them were, we, 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 we honor Workers Memorial Day. Um, we honor all the workers who get sick and passed away. We know so many of them were meatpacking workers last year because they didn't have a union strong enough or a government that cared enough to protect them. We can do more to help small and medium sized farmers grow their business and increase the amount of locally grown crops and livestock in their own communities. Uh, we had a hearing yesterday in the Banking and Housing Committee on the rural economy where we heard a lot about all the ways corporate consolidation and agriculture has and Senator Tester, who is an organic farmer in Montana, in Senator Tester's words, how the ag and corporate consolidation has simply dried up, his words, dried up communities around the country. Uh, conservative politicians blame, they, they, they think all the answers are more drilling, more uh, fracking, more coal, more oil, and that's going to rebuild uh, rural America. It's surely not. Um, it's, it's what we've done to agriculture in this country in so many ways. Uh, we can do more to make sure no neighborhood, no town, no county is without a market that sells fresh food. My wife and I live in Cleveland in zip code 44105. That zip code in the first half of 2007 had more foreclosures than any zip code in the United States. Uh, there is not a grocery store particularly close to this zip code, uh, just right outside, but not particularly close, certainly not walking distance to many, many families uh, that, that, that live in this neighborhood. If we're serious about ending hunger, 
we will do more to help people's hard work pay off. There's not, there's, there's just not much dignity in a job if it doesn't pay enough to put food on the table. Dr. King said no job is menial if it has an adequate wage attached to it, but so often it doesn't. We made more, I think we made important progress with, with that in the rescue plan with the dramatic expansion of EITC and CTC. Now we get to work to make those expansions permanent. Um, some some don't want to don't want it beyond one year. Uh, some want it five year extend, extension. Uh, a number, the majority of I think the majority of the Senate wants to see it permanent. Uh, as we work on all of that, we need your voices and your stories. And I'll, I'll close with this: every year, just last 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 week we did this, which is becoming an annual event. I ask six of my colleagues, three Republicans and three Democrats, to join me in the Senate floor to read from Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail. And uh, most of you aren't old enough to remember this, but most of you know the history, I assume, um, that Dr. King in 1963, while in jail, uh, was um, for doing what he did so well with civil disobedience, he wrote on mostly scraps of paper a letter to moderate white ministers who were saying to Dr. King, yeah, we, we want you, we want voting rights, we want equality, we want the civil rights bill, we want the voting rights bill, but don't go too fast. And so his letter, uh, the, the part of the letter that when we divide it into seven, so we each read a part, the part that I always grab is the, it includes these words when he said, Dr. Work King wrote, progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. Progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. And, it, and progress comes because of your activism and how you've devoted your life's work and what you're doing, Mr. Mitchell and Ms. Bechtel and all of you. And uh, it, it really, really matters. So thank you uh, for having me for a few minutes and thanks especially uh, for your service to people in this country and people around the world. Thanks so much. Thank you, Senator Brown, for all that you are doing on, on, on Capitol Hill and leading this effort. And thank you for your for being a champion for our cause. Of course. Uh, I'm, next, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Kelly Adesina. Kelly has an extensive experience in both the federal and private sector worlds, including a long career as chief counsel for the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Agriculture and a senior counsel in the office of the general counsel at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Kelly now serves as the director of federal government affairs for, for Bayer. Kelly, I'm gonna ask you uh, one, one question. I'd love to get your thoughts. From your perspective and background, what has USDA done in response to COVID to try and fill the gaps and breakdowns in our food systems? And where do you see opportunities for private sector companies to engage and make improvements? Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone on the call. Uh, first, before I uh, begin uh, answering your question, I want to thank the Alliance in Hunger and also FAO North America for having me here this morning. Um, as Eric mentioned, I used to work on Capitol Hill for the House Agriculture Committee, so I uh, definitely relish the opportunities to talk about nutrition and food insecurity because um, that was like my first love. Uh, so I think that what we, you know, saw during the pandemic and, you know, Beth and then Lindra have so eloquently and the Senator have pointed out is that we saw the vulnerabilities to our, you know, food system. You know, there were, I think here in America, we look at our food system, our agricultural system as one of the best in the world. But what we saw is that it, it wasn't resilient enough to be responsive to the needs that occurred during the pandemic, not as quickly as possibly it was needed. So um, USDA you know, responded by creating this uh, Farmers to Families food box, and that was um, made available through the Coronavirus Assistance Food uh, Program that was passed by Congress. And so with this Farmers to Families food box, it was something that was needed because as uh, I think uh, Senator Brown pointed out, there were you know, uh, fields being plowed, there was you know, food going to waste, there was milk being dumped, and at the same time, you had, you know, people that were in great need because they were, you know, out of work, restaurants, hotels, uh, food service businesses, they were all closed. And so you had this gap of this, you know, uh, increased surplus of goods, of commodities, and this increased, increased need, but no way to kind of, you know, connect the two. And so, you know, the uh, Farmers and Family Food Box was a solution to that. And so with that program, uh, USDA uh, purchased, you know, food boxes. 
They worked with national, local, and regional distributors to uh, get boxes of food and commodities uh, to the organizations that could then, you know, get those uh, food boxes to the people in need. And probably Carrie will talk about that uh, in greater detail when she's um, when she's asked the question. Uh, but you know, <clears throat> that program uh, supplied, I think, as I saw last week, 157 million uh, food boxes, and that was, you know, really good. Um, I think what we've seen now is that with this uh, current administration, um, they're going to discontinue uh, that program because they believe there were some administrative challenges. There's some things that can be improved. But just that the, uh, the need to have that shows that when we have a pandemic, when we have an economic crisis, we need to be able to be responsive you know, in a quicker manner. And so I'm sure there will be lessons learned from the program that can be applied going forward. Um, Secretary uh, Bill Sack of USDA um, mentioned that there's going to be uh, more reliance on the assistance, um, the food assistance program, which is uh, basically a program that is uh, run through food banks, and also thinking about a new dairy program. So there's going to be some restructuring of kind of like what we saw with that farm to family food box. But I think just the need and, and the, um, the existence of that program shows that we need to think about having some type of permanent plan in the future. I think as Verlindra, you know, pointed out, this is probably not the, the last economic or food crisis that we may undergo. And so I think that we should learn some lessons from this that we can apply going forward, particularly as we're starting to have, you know, conversations, you know, with the UN and other, you know, entities around global uh, policies. You know, this is a policy that should be taken into account. And to your question about, you know, what can corporate America, what can companies do? I will say that even though USDA has, you know, technical officers and people that uh, share this information with growers and how they can participate in these different programs, you'll be surprised to know that a lot of our growers, people that, you know, purchase seeds and, and other uh, crop protection measures from us, they didn't know about the program or they had questions. And so, you know, one simple thing that corporate America can do, what companies can do, is make sure that we are communicating and that our growers know about the programs that are available to them um, through the federal government. And of course, you know, we can also be, you know, supportive, making sure that we play a role, uh, figuring out whether it's, you know, information or there's something else that we need to do. Thanks, Kelly, for your for your for your comments and your thoughts, um, particularly on the role that corporate America can play, and, and also just being able to disseminate that information so folks know what resources out there, and recognizing that there is there needs to be some type of permanent solution to ensure that those gaps are filled. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to our fantastic uh, policy experts. Aaron Shire is the senior government relations representative for the National Farmers Union an organization that advocates for family, farmers, ranchers, fishers, and their communities through education, cooperation, and legislation. Carrie, Carrie Calvert is the Vice President of Government Relations for Feeding America, whose mission is to advance change in America by ensuring equitable access to nutritious food for all in partnership with food banks, policymakers, supporters, and the communities they serve. As we start out with a couple of questions for each of them, I encourage the audience members to ask questions that may have that they may have through the Q and A and chat features um, in your in your chat box. But Aaron, let me start with you. The members of your organization, farmers and ranchers, occupy uh, occupy that unique first step in the supply chain, producing the food that sustains us overall. Can you talk about some of the weaknesses in our food systems that had the greatest impact on farmers and ranchers during the pandemic, and what needs to be done to address these issues? Hi, everyone, and thanks, Eric, for the question. Um, really appreciate everyone joining this conversation today and uh, really appreciate the invitation for National Farmers Union to join the conversation. Um, I also wanted to share that uh, National Farmers Union is a, a member of the Alliance to End Hunger. Um, we feel it's, it's an indispensable way for us to join with organizations working across the food supply chain uh, to achieve a hunger-free world. Um, so I just wanted to highlight the importance of the Alliance uh, for NFU. To the question that Eric asked, um, I think we've already really, in some ways, touched on these things because um, 
Uh, we all know, I think at this point, right, the pandemic resulted in such drastic shifts in consumer demand, um, severe supply chain disruptions, and uh, leading to, to increased marketing costs for farmers, uh, difficulty finding markets. So, um, you know, I wanted to, to start by talking about how these shutdowns uh, were especially severe, uh, where commodities were perishable. I think Kelly mentioned, right, dumping of milk and other things like that. Um, so fruits, vegetables, milk, really difficult to find uh, markets quickly. Kelly mentioned Farmers to Families Food Box was one really important quick pivot for that. Um, I think a really stark example of uh, a disruption that was unique to farmers uh, that many experienced on the consumer end were disruptions with livestock uh, producers in terms of meat packing facilities shutting down. And I think this really highlights the fragility of, of our current system for everyone across the supply chain, farmers, uh, consumers, and workers. And in part, this is due to a trend toward fewer and larger plants. Uh, meat production per plant has increased threefold since 1976. Um, 12 plants, just 12 today, produce more than 50% of our country's beef supply. It's the, the numbers are similar in pork. Um, uh, this, this creates a less nimble system. When plants go offline, uh, there's reduced capacity, and um, that also means you can't, you can't process as many animals, and this reduces access for farmers to markets. It results in a lower pay, pay price for farmers uh, and increased prices for consumers, in some cases, shortages. So um, the pandemic highlighted this, but this really is an issue, right, that preceded the pandemic and our uh, member growers who represent about 200,000 farmers and ranchers across the country, uh, many were sounding the alarm about diminishing options for getting their products to market, uh, fewer smaller local or regional plants for them. Um, they've told us they need to schedule harvest dates out more than a year. And so I think a, a solution to this is a need to expand our local and regional processing infrastructure. Um, I think it also tells us in terms of what we saw with these um, processing plants that we need to further increase safeguards to protect worker health and safety. Um, one other issue I wanted to touch on briefly that I think pertains to these disruptions that we saw and how they affected farmers was um, the vulnerability of our supply chain uh, due to extreme concentration in our food system. Uh, the Senator mentioned this, the issue of, of corporate consolidation. A uh, Senator Tester, uh, you mentioned that Senator Tester brought it up just yesterday at a hearing. Uh, this is largely uh, a result of lax antitrust enforcement, and we need to make sure our antitrust laws are vigorously enforced um, and that our markets for agricultural goods and services are competitive and fair. Thanks, Aaron. Um, another question for you. You discussed uh, a few of the larger structural issues with our food within our food system and how the pandemic really highlighted the need for significant reforms. Can you talk about ways that farmers and ranchers adapted to this crisis and how effective were the federal programs at helping farmers addressing food insecurity? Sure. Well, farmers adapted um, largely through uh, two means one uh, creative shifts in marketing their products uh, and federal support. So a combination of those two, uh, which of course I shouldn't just say federal support, I trickle down to the, to the state level um, as well. In terms of the issue of creative marketing shifts, what I mean by that is that some farmers pivoted quickly uh, to address the shifts in demand that occurred as a result of the pandemic. For example, farmers producing for uh, local markets uh, were able to do this relatively well for, for sort of their farmers markets, community supported agriculture operations, um, anytime where they were more direct to the consumer um, because they had a, an easier time communicating with their, their members or their customers. Um, in some cases, they created online order and delivery systems where previously they didn't do that. You know, they'd acquire PPE and other things to make farmers markets safer. Um, 
I think that the way these more direct market operators um, function during the pandemic shows how these systems improve overall system resiliency and remind us that we should be doing more to buttress those, those local and regional and shorter supply chain systems to um, allow them to, to grow and flourish since uh, they're often under-resourced. On the federal support side of things, uh, Kelly, I think, did already a really good job mentioning um, some of those things. But uh, payments from USDA were really important through the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Um, the food purchase and distribution programs of various sorts, uh, especially the Farmers to Families Food Box, played an important role. And it did help some farmers uh, connect with consumers as sort of a unique program in that way. And in terms of the sport, some of it is ongoing, some of it is shifting. Kelly mentioned how uh, the food box program is ending in its current guise, um, but will likely sort of have, a, have it in a modified form going forward uh, due to some of the challenges with it administratively. And uh, USDA also rolled out sort of their, their broader plan, the Pandemic Assistance for Producers Program. I'm not sure yet whether we're supposed to call that uh, PAP or what, um, but that has a lot of different things in it that are important to assist farmers and thus, of course, ensure that food is getting onto consumers' um, tables. But uh, one thing I want to uh, touch on before I wrap up here is that with all of those things, the federal support and the, the pivoting that farmers were able to do, there were holes. Um, there were holes in federal support, uh, early rounds of the uh, coronavirus food assistance program uh, left out many smaller and underserved growers. Uh, there wasn't enough outreach. Um, Kelly talked about that importance of, of making sure folks know about the programs and what's available. Um, and uh, I think we've already touched on some of the shortcomings of the food box program. So I won't go um, in depth there really, but uh, the, the bottom line is uh, there, there needed to be greater access uh, for all producers uh, to that program who wanted to make sure they could serve people in their community who needed that food. So I think some lessons learned here is um, that farmers were remarkably resilient and capable of adapting. Federal investment was key and helpful, um, but there were some holes in that support. And we need to make sure support is distributed equitably and that it's accessible to all farmers who need it um, and not just to, to the best resourced. Thanks, Aaron, and I think your comments uh, has uh, started a number of questions, but before we turn to the q and I'm going to turn things over to Carrie and ask Carrie a few questions and, and, and give her a chance to make comments and respond. Uh, Carrie, very early on in the crisis, we noticed uh, massive disruptions in food availability through food banks due both to increased demand and difficulties in sourcing product. What were some of the biggest challenges your network faced? Yeah, uh, so thanks so much for, for that question. You're right. Um, you know, early on in um, when the pandemic first hit, our food banks were seeing uh, double um, demand. You know, some food banks were reporting like 100% increase in demand, others 50%, 60. It's averaged out. Um, over the last year to about a 50 to 55% increase in demand. You know, 40% of those that were coming to us had, had not needed um, emergency food assistance before. So right when the pandemic first hit, frankly, it was just um, a mismatch of supply and demand at our network, right? Uh, demand was much higher than the supply. Um, but the, uh, the nature of trying to um, provide emergency food assistance to double the normal amount of people in a public health pandemic meant that our food banks had to shift to um, you know, drive-through distributions with more boxed non-perishable product. We've since learned how to innovate and do perishable and non-perishable together, but that meant that at the same time that we needed more non-perishable product for increased needs from the community, um, consumers who uh, before the pandemic were, you know, um, uh, getting you know 50% of their their daily meals from um, food service and other consumer facing businesses. Everyone was at home eating, right? So there was a, a run on um, 
part perishable and non-perishable food at our, our retail system at the same time that there was a run on our, um, our nonprofit retail system, if you will. Um, to use an, an analogy for our food banks we hear often. Um, you know, I'm gonna echo the comments that a lot of others ha have made here. All of us have said, you know, our food supply chain is designed for efficiency and affordability and just-in-time delivery. And that is not always compatible with resiliency and um, flexibility and being able to, to turn uh, on a dime. I mean, looking back, the fact that um, the, co collectively as a nation, 50% of, of where we uh, accessed and consumed food from, the fact that, that up to 50% of that access changed over the last year, um, uh, I'm surprised that we didn't see more disruption looking back, right? Um, so, you know, we did see some resiliency, but there are still some, some gaps there and I'm happy to, happy to get to that when it's time. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, another question for you, looking forward, um, especially since infrastructure has become a front and center issue here on Capitol Hill, what considerations should policy, policymakers make or take into account so we, do, so we do not end up in such a fragile food security situation during the next crisis? Yeah, I, that's a that's a great point. You know, um, Feeding America supported um, the uh, Food Supply Protection Act that was introduced last year, and I think there are a lot of great ideas from that. Some of them have been incorporated, uh, broadly speaking, in the American Rescue Plan Act with um, some funding and some direction to USDA to to try to use the funds to um, you know make our food system more resilient and certainly. Um, we're all learning uh, new ways that infrastructure can be defined, like the, the care infrastructure, human infrastructure, but also, um, frankly, you know, how about the physical infrastructure of how our food moves? You know, um, a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables grown domestically are sold into our food service and restaurant system. Well, when uh, that demand is disrupted, you know, um, farmers can't afford to harvest, pack, and transport the food to a food bank to the to um, donate it you know there's there's not enough um, finances there so frankly you know um, I think there's a lot that the federal government can do to establish you know funding like it comes down to money right um, people are like farmers lost paying customers and um, they need to be compensated to provide that food to people that need it through food banks or other charitable institutions. You know, we need to fund that uh, resiliency in our food supply chain. Otherwise, you know, food banks can't afford to pay it all and I, growers and producers can't afford to do so either. They donate what they can, but we know much more could be done with, um, you know, adequate funding when there's these um, supply chain disruptions. And I just say, you know, we know that perishable foods are healthier for us. I, I love, um, I really do like how um, Secretary Vilsack is framing this as not just food insecurity, but it's nutrition insecurity. Um, perishable food costs more to obtain, a, a, you know, in the retail sector, and it costs more for food banks and, you know, the local agency partners that we're working with to distribute. Um, you know, there's, uh, there were challenges in USDA's operation of the Farmers to Food Box program, but at its core, what they were trying to do was, you know, purchase food that didn't have a buyer at the time and distribute it as quickly as possible and to try to account for, um, you know, any infrastructure gaps, right? Um, we think there's more equitable ways to do that and we're eager to see how USDA will, um, you know, retool things with the funding they have from the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, but, you know, I think we need to fundamentally realize that there is a cost and it will cost money to make our food supply chain more resilient in terms of reimbursing the growers and producers and also enabling um, that distribution of perishable nutritious food to people that need it. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Um, Aaron, do you have any thoughts on that question or? Anything else to add? I was just curious. Thanks for asking. No, not at the moment. I thought that was an excellent response. <laughs>
Oops, sorry. So we do have a first question from uh, the audience. Uh, here's a question. Our first question is, can the panelists please comment on the role that local and regional food systems can and or should play in fostering resilience in food systems? Um, I'm happy to, to start and really quickly. I, I think local and regional food systems are great. Um, State departments of ag, agriculture are um, deeply embedded in this issue in their community and I think are in a really strong place to make a lot of these connections. We saw some of this happen uh, in the pandemic. So, for instance, California utilized um, a new special crop block grant funding from fiscal year 2021 to put money into the um, Farmers to Families uh, produce program that our food banks and run with um, a lot of farmer partners in the state of California. I think it again comes down to funding. Um, you know, we need to make sure uh, regional food systems are equipped with the money to do this. I would, I would echo that sentiment. I think there's a, there's certainly been a lot more investment in local and regional food systems in recent years, but still not nearly enough. Um, for example, the in the last farm bill, in the 2018 farm bill sort of one of the, I guess you would say the flagship program for local and regional food systems, LAMP, which includes um, the Farmer's Market Promotion Program, the Local Food uh, Promotion Program, and the Value Added Producer Grant Program. You know, it, it now finally has $50 million uh, in funding per year, but that's very, very low uh, compared to a lot, of other, a lot of other ways that we invest federally in local and regional food systems. I think there's an opportunity to do more and strengthening those systems, those direct connections to consumers um, can be really good for farmers to capture a larger share, a larger share of the food dollar, the retail food dollar, um, and can also be really good for consumers to get um, healthy food, um, fresh food. So I think that, uh, that we need to do more to invest there. Thank you. Here's a um, question that I see is not a policy related question, but I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Um, how do you feel the media in the United States and elsewhere has covered food security issues during COVID? Uh, do you think the general public understands the scope of the problem? And was the story told of how households became vulnerable and what needed to be done? Did that really help? You know, was that was that helpful? Do you think? Gosh, um, interesting question. And, you know, um, I'm dating myself here, but I was at Feeding America during the, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010 recession as well. And one of the things that I've noticed is that when, when there's a big national catastrophe, whether it's a, a recession or maybe a, a regional natural disaster or say a global pandemic, uh, it serves as a great equalizer. People are, are able to understand this could happen to me, this could happen to a friend of mine, this could happen to a family member. And they're able to, um, I think, relate in a way. And uh, that is very, very helpful in terms of um, uh, reducing stigma in terms of food insecurity. It can happen to anyone. You can you know, experience economic insecurity and need additional resources. And that is no nothing to be ashamed of at all. Um, so I think that's helpful, um, but in a way, um, and it certainly has brought attention to how fragile the service sector economy is, how, um, you know, there are challenges with financial security for a lot of hourly wage earners. And those were a, a lot of um, the public that was impacted by the pandemic. I do think that, um, the general public wants to feel like things are getting back to normal. Uh, I think one of the things we'd like to see is attention paid to the fact that it will take, first of all, normal was not working for everyone equally in our economy, right? People were working hard, uh, qu still qualifying for food assistance and still needing help putting um, food on the table. You know, uh, a large part of people that come to us for help are food insecure and make too much to qualify for federal nutrition programs. So normal didn't work for everyone prior to the pandemic. But we also realize that it will take a while 
for people that were already food insecure to recover. And we wanna make sure that the public's attention is on that throughout the recovery. We need to make sure the recovery is equitable for everyone. Beth, I'm interested in getting your thoughts from a global perspective um, to, to that question, if you're, if you're able to respond. Yeah, sure. Um, again, from a, from a personal perspective, it was uh, a bit, you know, sort of surreal to watch what was happening in, in the U.S. and how that was being covered at a time when, you know, here in, in Italy and Europe, we had already gone into a national lockdown and were taking such what seemed like draconian and stringent uh, sort of restrictions um, across this country to, uh, to navigate the, the surge in, in the pandemic. But when you now step back and we're in this a year and we've seen how the pandemic has spread from continent to continent, country to country, one of the things that really does concern me in today's environment is that many of us, um, I think it sort of under, undergirds Carrie's comment, we each are kind of looking at, at getting out of the COVID sort of uh, situation through our own sort of country level or our own sort of state or community level lens, you know, how soon we're still in lockdown in a way in Rome, right? The cafes and, and the pizzerias aren't open here. And that's all people in Rome can sort of think about is how soon does that come back? When at the same time, we realize that even just, I think today it was announced that today may be the highest number of cases total worldwide in the last year. You were not thinking about the impacts that are taking place in Brazil, that are happening in Venezuela, that are happening in Iran, that are happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, these other parts of the world that, that still are, are just struggling from a containment perspective, let alone have the hopes of really, you know, navigating vaccinations or even beginning to come back to these conversations about resiliency and building back better and, and beginning to really rethink um, a number of their own, uh, you know, programmatic uh, requirements. So there's, there's a disparity there. And I, I hope that conversations like this allow for all of us to kind of keep our attention on what has been a global challenge that requires global solutions, um, that we can't go back into really sort of our more nationalistic kind of narrowly focused, um, you know, prisms and lenses, but really need to take this opportunity. And I think the media, the question about the media, that that is one where we have a real opportunity with them to, I think, tell that broader story. And um, I think I think it's probably not been done as effectively as as it needed to be. Thank you, Beth. And Vim Linder, I see that you have your hand raised. Yeah, just uh, Eric, just uh, to compliment on what Beth said and to uh, for the benefit of our listeners, just want to draw their attention to what we have at FAO, the data lab, the data lab, uh, which actually uh, scrutinizes 270 newspapers around the world and the latest tweets. And we have a semantic search engine for all news collected on Google. So it, it, it does a search for COVID-19 impact analysis and uh, on daily info and impact uh, on, on food security, food value chains, et cetera. And this is what we then provide the countries with facts and information as evidence. So just invite all our listeners and all our participants to Google FAO Data Lab and you'll get all information there. So there is a lot of information available through the media, which FAO uh, really gets into and uses to generate evidence for governments all around the world. Just, just a, 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 the information there. Thank you so much for that. And Aaron, I have a question for you. Uh, what kind of laws and uh, policies either encourage consolidation of meatpacking plants or make local slaughter wholesaling difficult. If you can touch on that. That's a, that's a really good question. I think the issue has more to do with um, some of the, the lack of enforcement of, of some of our existing laws uh, that have allowed for quite a bit of consolidation in that industry. Um, on the other hand, part of it is just the fact that, I, I think Carrie mentioned this and others have too, about how some of these systems, these 
these bigger plants or larger scale things are efficient. They are, they do create certain efficiencies, um, but they may be more likely to, um, to crack um, or to break under certain pressures. And so uh, part of that is a structural economic issue. Um, and uh, part of what I think we need to, to do is given the fact that the economies of scale aren't in the favor of some of the smaller plants necessarily um, is we need to find creative solutions um, to, um, to helping existing plants uh, expand to accept um, animals that aren't uniform in a certain way. And then also to help new plants come online where it makes sense. Um, but for example, say a mobile processing unit that um, can get around to different locations where there's just not enough supply in that region, but where those mobile units could help. So I don't think it's just about laws. I think in some cases with the scale of, of meat processing, it's, it's kind of about uh, challenging economics. Thank you. And, and Aaron, actually, I'm going to keep you in the quote unquote hot seat just for one more, another question. And actually, sure. this part can go to both uh, you and Beth to get a global perspective. Uh, this is around um, the challenges that Black, Indigenous, and Latino farmers are facing or have faced in, in, in as part of this discussion. Can you, just, can you touch on some of that, or what um, underrepresented farmers are, are facing as part of, as a result of COVID? And then baby Beth, from your perspective, from a from the countries that you are working with and partnering with and the farm, the local farmers that you're working there, you can also discuss maybe some of the challenges that they are also facing. Uh, but Aaron, I'll turn, I'll start with you and then kick it over. Sure. There are uh, major inequities in our, our current food system. Um, and certainly, I think this connects to some of the issues I was uh, talking about earlier. Um, uh, that some, some farmers um, of all stripes are, are operating on a smaller scale um, or aren't connected into um, the same networks and might not be reached, say, by our federal support programs. And uh, we need to make sure that, um, that USDA is reaching everybody and supporting everyone. Um, and uh, I think that this also connects to um, uh, farmers uh, of, of color, underserved producers may be producing at all scales, but I think this does connect to that issue of local and regional food systems. Um, I think it comes down to issues of, of land access and inequities around that. Um, so I think there are a lot of different issues in that regard. And Beth? Sure. So, I mean, clearly, you know, as, as uh, we work in so many of the developing countries, we're, we're working with uh, wide constituency of farmers, whether that's based on nationality, ethnicity, gender, heritage, and tradition. Um, you know, we think about how we can best support the, the farming practices, sustainable agricultural production practices, and ultimately livelihoods for women in agriculture, for young people in agriculture, um, for uh, those who um, have, uh, again, sort of uh, struggled to, to um, you know, advance their livelihoods and their, their business operations. One particular group that we know that has been um, incredibly affected are, are, again, women farmers. Um, around the world. Um, and, you know, that is, I think, something that this pandemic, um, again, regardless almost of socioeconomic status, has revealed as you think about women not only in the workforce in a professional setting, but also as caretakers for a family, um, whether that's the generation ahead of them or the generation of children that they're raising, providing that kind of, of family support. Um, many times, especially in Africa, we have women farmers who are not only um, you know, navigating the, the business, but they're also doing the work at the same time that they also are supporting families. And so when you have not only a pandemic that creates this health crisis 
for families and for communities, but is now a, a real economic crisis um, as they can't get products to marketplaces or can't have access to other kinds of production inputs. It creates and amplifies, magnifies the problem even further. And so, again, I think for us to answer that question, it may, you know, sort of be a, a bit different than a, a question of ethnicity as it is almost a, a regional or a, a demographic question. But I would say that, you know, those are underserved populations that we focus on um, in really all of our programming at FAO. Now with the pandemic, we're really sort of trying to make sure that, you know, not only are we navigating support for their agricultural production, practices, but now having to also, I think, be mindful of the underlying effects on their overall livelihoods um, and finding ways to support that through jobs promotion and other kinds of infrastructure and resiliency um, programs is something that's been really important for us. Thank you for that. Oh, uh, go ahead, Karen. Karen. I, I would just add in that um, you know, one of the questions we've had for USDA is, you know, how can, um, you know, the Department of Agriculture procures and buys a lot of food, right? And there are already federal procurement, um, you know, administrative procedures for set-asides in procurement for um, small businesses, for veteran-owned businesses, and for disadvantaged business enterprises. So, one of the questions we have to USDA is, you know, are you able to uh, do more set asides in your procurement of food. You know, you're buying food every year. Is that, you know, can you do a pilot? Are there other things you can do to see how federal procur procurement can help support um, not only local and regional food systems, but also um, support uh, growers that that need the economic help? Um, you know, I, I don't think it gets at the whole of the problem at all. But you know, I, I think. We should ask how can this how can equity or equitable access both really be looped into all aspects of you know how the federal government is purchasing and providing food thank you so much for thank you everyone for your comments i have another question um this is back to a policy specific policy question uh the previous COVID relief packages as you all know had a lot of expansions in snap program WIC, and other domestic nutrition programs what are some of the opportunities that we see looking ahead that can make some of those temporary extensions and, and, and improvements uh, permanent? Just want to get, as we, since we have Hill staffers in, uh, in the audience, just want to give them a chance to see where they can fit in and, and helping to make some of these improvements uh, permanent. Would love to see a lot of the investment in nutrition security that were in the American Rescue Plan Act extended for the length of the recovery. You know. Um, uh, I think, uh, was it CBO that estimated that a return to full employment for all sectors impacted by the pandemic wouldn't be until 2024. Um, you know, that timeline may, may shift as, you know, economic conditions uh, change. You know, for instance, we estimated that last year that up to 50 million people could be food insecure in 2020. You know, thanks to a lot of the federal investments and, um, you know, an improvement in unemployment rates. Um, you know, our estimates of food insecurity are 42 million in 2021. So we've already seen, you know, that the things can shift quickly, but uh, the role of the federal government in providing resources, not only for the immediate urgent need, but throughout the recovery is, is just unparalleled. You know, for every one meal we provide, SNAP provides nine. So there is definitely no way um, we're able to meet the need without a robust investment from, um, you know, the federal government and from Congress. And um, we're hoping uh, to see continued interest in strengthening federal nutrition programs. Aaron, do you have any? I would, I would echo those sentiments. Um, as important as it is in thinking about, right, how we, during the pandemic, um, made sure excess uh, crops and, and livestock had a place to go. Um, SNAP and uh, things like universal school meals, um, access, these sorts of things are, are crucial. Um, and 
I think it's it's important to take the opportunity, um, given some of those uh, expansions and strengthenings during um, the last year or so, um, to continue to move the ball forward in that area. So we we certainly support that as well at National Farmers Union. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to go through some of our some of the questions that we have not already answered in, in some capacity. There's a number of questions in the chat box that are looking for partnership opportunities. Uh, so that could be ways for you guys to respond uh, within the chat box. Um, one particular question was, and you probably said this already, but you just you know, say it again, it's like how much of the critical infrastructure for food security was unprepared for the pandemic and I guess what parts of the infrastructure can be imp improved in a post pandemic world? You know, I'd be interested in, in hearing um, how the, the private sector um, and, and um, in other NGO partners um, on this briefing would respond to this. But um, I mean, there's a, a balance between, you know, do the gaps indicate that we need to build additional infrastructure or that we need to have more mobile flexible options, whether it's mobile meat processing, mobile canning. For instance, um, a lot of the areas where our food banks have partnerships with farmers, um, the area that that food bank serves is saturated and can't take any more fresh produce, right? Even when we're paying the pick and pack out costs for the donated produce, you know, we're paying the labor and the packing cost for the farmer, he's donating the, the food. Um, they can't take more. So it costs so much to ship it that, um, you know, uh, produce donations were going unmatched in our network. Um, you know, Feeding America has stepped up and we're covering um, half of the cost to transport that. So, you know, what's more affordable, mobile canning operation or, you know, trucking crops from one state to a next because there's an oversupply here and there's a need in another state. Frankly, I, I think they're both going to be a very similar cost, but we need mobile flexible operations. If we have decreased food access in communities, that's where you know, uh, mobile grocery, mobile food distribution, um, you know, that is where you can add um, you know, some of those, um, that additional flexibility um, for what's already not there, so. Let's Thanks, Carrie. Let's go ahead and we can actually, we'll start, start wrapping it up. And um, I would like to provide each of you an opportunity to provide a very uh, top line message that you would like participants to, to walk away from, like you'd like the audience to walk away from, especially since we have a number of Hill staffers here. Uh, Aaron, I'll start with you. Okay, sounds good. Um, a top line message. I think that the, the pandemic has shined a light on um, many of the shortcomings in our food system. I think we talked about um, so many of those today and we need to build a more resilient and diverse farm and food system um, that ensures both that, that farmers can earn a healthy living um, and that nobody goes hungry. Now that's pretty high level, but I think you were going for high level, right? Yeah. <laughs> Beth? Sure, uh, maybe two points. Um, one, I'm not sure if this is an international day or how it's recognized, but I've been told by my team that today is national or inter international or world innovation and creativity day. Um, it seems like there's a day for, for everything now, but um, I think it's, it's an important reminder around a conversation like this to really highlight innovation. And I saw a couple of, of um, uh, comments in the chat, and I know I referenced it a, a little bit in, in my comments as well, you know, that's everything from policy innovation, uh, and I think Senator Brown really raises a lot of very important new ideas. I mean, I'm just going to say to this group, it's been probably almost, um, boy, it's going on 20 years since I was on Capitol Hill myself and was a part of crafting a farm bill. Um, and they've changed a lot in those 20 years. But I would just say from now an outside looking in perspective, this might be one of those windows.
windows to really bring significant policy change to U.S. agriculture um, as a result of this pandemic. Again, looking at it as an opportunity. And then in the world of technology, you know, we're now in a place where, again, in my previous life, I was probably focused on so many of the blue sky sort of bells and whistles, game changing technologies that are coming to food and agriculture. Today, you know, we're focused on some of the most basic kinds of technology and innovation applications for farmers in other parts of the world that some of them may have been adopted by, you know, my family 40 to 50 years ago and just have not either been adaptable or affordable. So innovation, I think, is one last key message that I would want to bring. And the last point I would make is just as we all have this opportunity to have dialogue around food systems transformation, please, please, please don't lose sight of thinking about it through a global lens. It's got to be a local context. I understand that. But I think with, again, the UN Food Systems Summit coming up, there is an opportunity presenting itself to all of us with the attention on food and agriculture, on climate, and now the pandemic. This is our window of opportunity to bring the alignment and the linkages between and among these systems, the solutions, the fixes, the improvements, all together so that we're having it on a more macro uh, level of discussion, which is part of what I love about today's conversation itself. So thanks again. Thank you, Beth, and thank you for highlighting uh, the moments and opportunities that we have in front of us to, to, to take advantage of this situation. Uh, Carrie, last remarks? Well, thank you. Um, you know, I, I agree. Um, you know, it, it strikes me the similarities between what we're seeing at the global level and what we see in, in the US. Uh, I'm not gonna say it's comforting to realize that there are these, that the same challenges are repeated just on a different scale, but um, I do think it helps us in understanding what works and how that can be replicated in other places. Um, so I, I think what I would leave people with is, you know, we need to make sure we're um, providing the right tools for a strong recovery for uh, the people facing hunger, for businesses and our food system and growers that have been impacted by this pandemic, um, because that will frankly help our economy rebound in a much stronger way. And uh, I know it, it's hard to keep um, you know, going back to the well and, and asking for more resources, but that is the place we are at. Um, I shared a link to our Feeding America's estimates of food insecurity for 2021, as well as our priorities for COVID-19 recovery in the chat box. Um, you know, likely just like we're going to need additional investments in um, safety net systems, I'd say don't overlook the safety net system for our, our food system. Um, you know, we've seen a little bit of funding allocated to that in legislation last year and in the recent bill. I don't think that's going to be the last amount of funding that's going to be needed. Um, but we have an opportunity to learn from, uh, from this. I'm not normally a silver linings person, but we can learn from this to make sure the funding and the structure is there so that further disruptions don't result in um, you know, the, the visuals that the Melinda mentioned earlier of you know, nutritious food being wasted and miles long lines at food banks. That's not something we want to see um, you know, I know it still happens sometimes, but I think we've come a long way from there and we'd like to see that um, progress continue. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you, Carrie, Beth, and Aaron for your insight and expertise. I also want to thank uh, Kelly from Bear for, for her thoughts on what the private sector's role is. And then obviously we want to thank Senator Brown uh, for his leadership and all that he is doing to help, again, like I said, really move this needle on Capitol Hill. I'm going to turn it back over to my friend and colleague, Vim Lindra, who's going to provide us with uh, closing remarks. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you've left me with an extremely difficult job because uh, compressing all that we heard just now from such brilliant uh, speakers and thinkers and doers, it's just next to impossible for me to put it all together within a minute or two. But uh, I'll give it a shot. While I was listening to this conversation, what really struck chord with me was the fact that there are 
contexts, and these contexts are different in which all of us are operating in different countries are operating. But I found that with every speaker from uh, Senator Brown to Beth to Kerry to Arant, Kerry, every one of them had two issues which were common. And those are the only two words which I really want to highlight. And they are access and equity. That is something which each and every speaker underlined, highlighted, spotlighted. And that is something which we really have to take it back with us and work on it, talk about it, because till and until we establish an equitable system, till and until we establish access, not just for food, as Beth pointed out, but to every other aspect, whether it be input, whether it be finance, whether it be whatever you can think of in this whole uh, arena, access and equity will remain the uh, top two bullets on which I think policymakers and others in this sector will need to keep working on as we build back better. Uh, as it is today, uh, we know that uh, there is perhaps more, more fruit in a rich man's shampoo today than on a poor man's plate. So that, that needs to change. That needs to change fast. We need to work on nutrition, we need to work on food, and we need to work on hunger. Now, uh, those were uh, my thoughts on the negative side, but I want to leave all of you with a very, very uh, positive feeling because uh, this, this pandemic also has brought forth, I thought, uh, extremely strong, resilient humankind, which responded very strongly and has managed to find ways to survive and to do well and bounce back. And that is uh, extremely important for us to imbibe that spirit of resilience as we go forward. There'll always be uh, you know, enough negativity to speak about on, on all fronts, but humankind, uh, I don't think we can afford to go forth with such negativity. Our energy has to be directed to objectively understanding and identifying issues, we have to consolidate our very small gains and, and uh, look forward to better days and to building back better. So uh, I, think, I really want to thank all our speakers for uh, sharing their uh, uh, honest, truthful, frank, and at times very undiplomatic uh, ideas. Uh, thank you so much. And that's exactly why we want to have such webinars where we can engage in a truthful, honest, uh, discussion because it's not finger pointing. It's just trying to raise issues for all of us to understand and go back and work on. So thank you very much for joining us today and giving us your time. Uh, with that, Eric, uh, let me say uh, uh, goodbye, a very warm goodbye and have a good day all of you. Thank you. Thank you.